Hey besties, welcome back to my channel. My name is Black Serum, and how are we doing today? Are we sad? Happy? Let me know in the comments. First of all, happy Pride Month to the Look About the Quad community. And congratulations to all of my high school babes. Finally, you're done with Gao Kao, the college entrance exam. And speaking of high school graduation, let me know in the comments how you're gonna celebrate this. Are you going somewhere? Are you going to get a double eyelid surgery? Because apparently, this is very common in Asia, especially in Korea and China, that people will get a double eyelid surgery during the summer. And the reason why I'm asking you this is because today's story is about a girl. She went missing during her high school graduation trip. It's the story of Natalie Holloway. So what happened to her? Let's talk about it. So who is Natalie Holloway, you may ask? Natalie Holloway. She was born on October 21st, 1986 in Memphis, Tennessee. She was the first of two children born to Dave and Beth Holloway. And her dad was an insurance agent from State Farm and her mom, Beth, worked in education. Her parents got divorced in 1993. Natalie and her younger brother, Matthew, they were raised by Beth. In 2000, Beth remarried to a prominent businessman in Alabama whose name is George Twitty. So from then, the whole family moved to Mountain Brook, Alabama. And according to the internet, Mountain Brook is a very upscale suburb in Alabama. So our girl, Natalie, she graduated with honor in May 2005 from Mountain Brook High School. And Natalie was a very smart girl. She was in the National Honor Society. She was in a dance squad. She also participated in a lot of extracurricular activities. And the most importantly, she got accepted from the University of Alabama with both scholarship for the pre-med major because she wanted to be a doctor. So from the look, family, education, she's had it all. On May 26, 2005, Natalie went on a five-day trip with 124 fellow graduates to a small island called Aruba. And if you search Aruba on the internet, Aruba is a very tiny, exotic island, but very beautiful. Along with all the students, there's also seven chaperones, which included the school faculty members. They check with all the students every single day, but even though there's no way they're gonna keep on track with everybody, because there's just so many people. There's literally 125 students. Like, how can they keep on track with everybody? There's no way. While everybody was there, guess what they did? They were playing Monopoly in their hotel room with their pajamas on. Bitch, of course not. They were drinking, partying, clubbing every single night. Honestly, it was anticipated because you know why? In most countries, the legal drinking age is 18 years old. But in the United States, the legal drinking age is 21. So imagine a bunch of American students, they come to an island, which allow them to drink. Obviously, they're gonna drink their tits off. If I was them, I would do the same thing. Okay, so I'm not trying to blame anybody who was having fun. And plus, this was the last chance for them to be a high schooler. It was their last hurrah. Obviously, they're gonna have fun. They're gonna leave a memory that will never forget. So they were drinking, switching rooms every single night. And it was so wild, even the hotel that they were staying at. They staying at the Holiday Inn Hotel, so the Holiday Inn told them, you guys are not welcomed the next year. It was that wild. So Natalie was drinking all day, every single day throughout the whole trip. And according to her classmates, she started every morning with cocktails. She's like, um, where's my pina colada? Where's my cosmopolitan? I need my cocktails. On May 30th, they were scheduled to fly back home to the United States. But something strange happened. Natalie didn't show up for the return flight. Her packed luggage, her passport, was still in the room, but she's not there. Where's Natalie? So immediately the school contacted the local police, also Natalie's parents. Natalie was last seen by her classmates around 1.30 a.m. in the morning. As she was leaving the club, she was seen getting into a car with three guys. One is a 17-year-old Dutch student whose name is Joran van der Sloot. And there's also two brothers. We're gonna call them Kopo brothers. One is 18 years old who goes by the name Satish Kopo. And the other one is 21 years old who goes by the name Deepak 
Kobo. Immediately following by Natalie's disappearance, Natalie's parents flew to Aruba with a private jet, and within four hours of landing in Aruba, they already gathered all the information. So they went to the hotel, and the guy in the hotel told them, You see this guy in the security camera? Well, his name is Yoran van der Sloot. They showed up at Yoran's house. They were like, Don't, don't, don't. Yoran opened the door. And you know what happened? And it just so happened. The Copo brothers were there too. Oh wow, what a coincidence, huh? And Yoran said, What are you looking for? Where's Natalie? Natalie who? Uh, the girl you were with last night? I wasn't with any girl last night. What are you talking about? And it was this time. Deepak, he's like, Yo, remember bro? Yesterday, we were with the girl at the beach. Remember that? Remember that? That macrame is not gonna hitch itself. <laughs> oh, 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 you mean that girl? That's her name? Her name is Natalie? I didn't even know her name. We didn't ask for her name. No, Yorobu. Does this make any sense to you? What's the first thing you're gonna do when you meet a person for the first time? Obviously, introduction. What do you mean you don't know her name? Huh? Yoron told them. He drove Natalie to a beach because she wanted to see sharks. Well, according to what you just said, if you guys spend time at the beach, how come you didn't even know her name? That doesn't make any sense, okay? And after spending some time at the beach, he drove her back to the hotel around 2 o'clock in the morning. Natalie got out of the car, but she took a fail, but refused for his help. It sounds like there's so many unnecessary details. You know, when someone is lying, they will literally bullshit. They will give you like those irrelevant details that nobody is asking for. As they were driving away, he noticed that Natalie was approached by a dark man wearing a black uniform similar to those security guards on the island. The search for Natalie began immediately, and her disappearance actually attracted a lot of attention because remember I said, Aruba is such a small island, and a Caucasian American girl is missing on this island? Oh, you bitch's sweet ass, it's gonna be sensational. Bitch, it was huge in both Aruba and the United States. So if you ever lived in the United States in the 2000s, it was literally everywhere. It was on CBS, CNN, Fox, it was on magazines, newspaper. They were rolling, looking for Natalie. 24-7 on TV and my friend still remembers to this day. She said she was 10 years old at the time and she still remembers seeing her face on the TV. Hundreds of volunteers from both Aruba and the United States, they joined together to find Natalie. And during the first days of search, the Aruban government gave thousands of civilians a day off to just look for Natalie to find this American girl. 50 Dutch Marines conducted an extensive search looking for Natalie. They even had a dive team. They were under the sea, under the water, 100 meter deep, looking for Natalie. And the Aruban Bank, they raised $20,000 and other support with Natalie's parents. They offered $175,000 in reward looking for her daughter's safe return. They checked the CCTV in the hotel lobby, but didn't see Natalie appeared on any security cameras, which is so weird. Like, how is this possible? But according to the police, they said there's actually other ways to get to her room. She doesn't have to get through the main lobby or go up to the elevator. Apparently, there are other ways to go back to her room. The police found a possible blood sample from Deepak's car, and it was later tested and determined not to be blood. The Aruban police detained two security guards from the nearby hotel on suspicion of murdering and kidnapping Natalie Holloway because of what Yoran had told them. Remember, Yoran was like, oh, as we drove away, I saw there's a guy who looks like a security guard. They were known for cruising hotels to pick up a woman, and one of them actually got arrested before, but they had nothing to do with Natalie's disappearance, so the police had them had to let them go. On June 9th, Yora and the Coco brothers, they were arrested on the suspicion of kidnapping and murdering Natalie Holloway. And here's the thing with Aruban law. The Aruban police officers, they can make an arrest based on suspicion. Let's just say if they see you on the street, they think you're suspicious, they can literally arrest you on the spot, but in order 
to keep you in the custody, they need to produce evidence. Otherwise, they have to let you go. So from this moment on in the story, you're gonna hear a lot of people just getting arrested left and right. According to one of the detectives, he said they weren't going to arrest Yoran and the Kobo brothers right away because three days after Natalie had disappeared, they were heavily monitoring these people. They wiretapped their phones, they tracked their emails, and they were even following them in cars. So Natalie's parents said, why don't you arrest them? They definitely have something to do with my daughter's disappearance. Just take action and arrest them. And I honestly don't blame them for cap pressuring and pushing the police officers to their jobs. And think about it. If, if this happens to any of us, we're probably going to do the same thing. We're probably going to go even crazier. The Aruban police arrested so many suspects that potentially that has something to do with Natalie's case. But they all let them go. They even arrested Yoran's father and when it comes to Yoran's father let me just tell you one thing that you'll be like oh yeah that makes sense of course so apparently Yoran's father he was working in the law enforcement and he was a judge to be trained yeah so at one point things were getting very heated and these three people they were being very agitated. I don't know what happened between them, but something must have happened because they started changing statements every time when the police asked them. They switch a story. They give a new version of the story like they can never stick to one story. So the Kobo brothers were like, um, it was Yoran who drove Natalie to the beach. We had nothing to do with this. But Yoran was like, oh, um, they drove me back to my house first that then natalie was with them yes bitch they started arguing in front of the judge throwing each other under the bus and like pointing fingers at each other no you did it you did i didn't do that no i didn't do that girl what so they probably got arrested for like 60 times and every time they have a new story according to the deputy chief of police in aruba he said this girl She's a blonde girl from Alabama, from the United States. She's not going to be in the car with two black kids. So they didn't buy what Yoron had told them. And another thing is, Yoron was one of the few people who spoke English on that island. He was a Dutch student who grew up in an English background. So he spoke English, not like the Coppola brothers. They didn't speak English. So there's no way Natalie would be in the car with the Coppola brothers alone. So that's why the Coppola brothers, they were released on Monday, July 4th, but Yoran, he was detained for an additional 60 days. On July 4th, the loyal Netherlands Air Force deployed three F-16 aircraft equipped with infrared sensors. That sounds like a very high power technology, right? But guess what? Bitch, nothing. Nothing came out. I know. What the fuck? And the local gardener came forward with some information. He had seen Yoran attempting to hide his face as he drove into a nightclub with the Kobo brothers. On the very early morning of May 30th between 2.30 and 3 o'clock in the morning. After the statement from the local gardener, another person who was a jogger came out and said he saw men were burying a blonde haired woman in the landfill. So initially, the landfill was already searched by the police, but with that statement, when this statement came out, the police and the FBI searched this landfill for an additional three more times. The FBI even used the cadaver dogs. And guess what? They found nothing. They didn't even found a piece of dog shit. And this is getting ridiculous. How could a person just disappear on a small island? That doesn't make any sense. And bitch, let me tell you, the police literally flipped the whole island over up and down, left and right, leaving no stones unturned, they found absolutely fucking nothing. Like, literally nothing. Like, how is this possible? And Natalie's parents initially offered $175,000 with the donation of $50,000 on the side, but two months later, bitch, it got increased to $1 million. A lot of people were arguing, okay, the Aruban Police Department is definitely corrupted. There are probably politics involved. The reason why I say this is because apparently the Aruban police officers, they arrested a the guy who was one of the Aruban politicians' son. He got arrested, but he got released after that. 
very quickly. So a lot of people were like, okay, there's got to be somebody in higher power. I'm manipulating the whole thing. There's probably human trafficking involved. Now at this point, everything was in stagnant, a dead end. They spent so much money and energy on this case and according to the Aruban government, they said they spent $3 million, which it was 40% of the police operational budget. On this case alone, they spent $3 million on one case and it came on nothing? Are you fucking kidding me? So, before they officially decided to close this case, the deputy came out and said, We believe that Natalie was not kidnapped or murdered. We believe that she died from alcohol or drug poisoning and somebody buried her. And just because the case is closed, that doesn't mean the story is over. So, I'm going to put on some lashes. I'll be right back. Okay. In April 27, you're wrong. Remember this motherfucker? You would not believe what the fuck he did. So, he published a book called The Case of Natalie Holloway. And in this book, he explained his perspective on the night of the Natalie disappearance. And he said in this book, I am so sorry for the initial dishonest but I remain innocent. Why would you even fucking lie if you're innocent? That doesn't make any sense. Why would you even do that? Like, what the actual fuck? On April 27, the case got reopened. So, when Aruba closed this case, the Dutch authority picked it up and they say they never stopped investigating. So, a new search involving approximately 20 investigators, they showed up at Yoran's family's house and they raided the whole house. They checked the backyard. They even used the metal rods to penetrate the dirt. They confiscated his dad's personal diary and computer. And once again, they found nothing. Literally nothing. On December 18, the prosecutor officially declared the case is closed. And no one is being charged due to lack of evidence. As the case was closing, and the Coppos brother's attorney said this to the prosecutor. He said, unless you see the dead body in the bathroom with my client, there's no way in hell you can arrest them again. Because at this point, the Coppos brothers and Yoran, they have been arrested so many times. They probably spent more time in the police station than regular police officers. Even though the case was closed and Natalie's mom, Beth, she never gave up. She was still doing interviews with all the major news like CNN, CBS, Fox, she was even on the show Dr. Phil just to keep the bus going and hopefully it's gonna attract more people. She will fly back to Aruba every time if there's new evidence or there's new witnesses but every time she comes back with nothing but only disappointment. On January 31st, 2008, a Dutch crime reporter, Peter, he said, if you want to know the truth of Natalie Holloway, set your fucking alarm and everybody tune in on February 3rd. So a couple days later, the broadcast aired on Dutch national television. Apparently, they put a hidden camera in a vehicle that belonged to a guy whose name is Patrick, who gained Yoran's trust. So in the vehicle, they were talking and smoking marijuana at the same time, and apparently Yoran confessed it to him. In the video, Yoran said, after they had sex, Natalie started convulsively shaking and he was trying to reviving her, but failed. So he panicked. He picked up the phone, he called his friend, he's like, oh my god, what am I supposed to do? And his friend told him, don't worry about this, I'll take care of it, I'll dispose the body for you. Then later, his friend actually came out and said, dude, what the fuck are you talking about? I was literally at school this time. Yoran later came out and denied the whole thing. He said, I was high. I was only messing with him. But here's the thing. Marijuanas don't make you lie. Alcohols don't make you lie. As a matter of fact, they do the opposite. They give people the courage to speak the truth. So y'all motherfuckers need to stop using alcohols and drugs as an excuse for all the bullshitting. In March 2008, a friend of Yoran was secretly taped after giving an interview for Aruban Television. He told them that Yoran was expected to make millions of dollars off of this Natalie's case and Natalie is no longer alive anymore. She's dead and he knew who killed her. 
but he's never gonna tell. On November 24th, he did an interview with Fox. He said he's involved with human trafficking in Bangkok. For everybody he sells, he makes more than $13,000. So he sold Natalie to somebody in Venezuela, and his dad is actually aware of this. He even provided a recording. So in the recording, he's talking to his dad. He's like, uh, yeah, human trafficking, yeah, yeah, yeah. But later upon investigation, it turns out the voice of the dad, it was actually you're wrong pretending. So he was playing two characters back and forth. I don't know why the fuck he did this. He probably had some antisocial personality disorder and everything coming out of his mouth was a fucking lie. Well, I believe there's got to be some truth. You know, he just like kept saying stupid shit. But there's got to be something that was true, but nobody believed him. On March 29th, 2010, Yoron contacted Beth, legal representative. He was like, I'm going to tell you where I hide Natalie's body. But first, you're going to give me $250,000 with a down payment of $25,000. How about that? They immediately notified the FBI and they also wire transferred $15,000 to his account in Netherlands and $10,000 in cash because they need physical evidence in order to catch him. So when Yoron took the money, he was like, bye, then he went to Peru. But with this physical evidence, they can charge him with extortion and wire fraud. And now they're fighting for this case to be transmitted to Interpol so they can extradite Yoron to the United States. While everything is crumbling down on Yoron, another incident happened. On May 30th, 2010, five years to the day after Natalie's disappearance, Stephanie Flores, she's a 21 years old business student, and she was reported missing in Lima, Peru. She was found dead three days later in a hotel room with blunt force trauma on her head and guess whose name was registered in the hotel room? Yoram Vindersloot. These two met at a casino and apparently Stephanie was very lucky that night. She won $10,000 in cash. So one thing led to another. They went to the hotel room. And later, the hotel room security camera captured Yoron walking out of the room, carrying a bag that contained all the cash and credit cards. Then he ran away to Chile. When he got arrested, he told the police that was his initial story. He said, I didn't know what happened. I was so scared. There were three guys just beating her and I was hiding in the closet. So they killed her. I didn't know what happened. But later, he changed his statements. He actually confessed of murdering Stephanie Flores. He said he lost his temper after he found out that Stephanie was accessing his laptop without his permission. And she found information about Natalie Holloway. And honestly, I don't know what the fuck is going on with his mind. But on January 11th, 2012, he was charged with first-degree murder in Peru and got sentenced for 28 years. While he was in the prison, he did an interview and he admitted to the extortion plot. He said, I wanted to get back to Natalie's family because her parents have been making my life tough for five years. Bitch, the fucking audacity, y'all. What the fuck did you do to them? They should have hired a fucking sniper and shoot you in the fucking head. In June 11th, Six years after Natalie's disappearance, Dave Holloway filed a petition with the Alabama courts to have his daughter declared legally dead. And the whole thing doesn't end it here. And this literally happened this month. It literally just happened. It's fresh. On June 9th, he was arranged in a federal court in Birmingham on one count of extortion and one count of wire fraud against Bethany Holloway. He pleaded not guilty to each charge. And according to his lawyer, he only accepts the not guilty plea. But everything is currently under wraps and we don't know what's going to happen. I genuinely hope that eventually he's gonna receive a sentence that require him to serve many years. And I also hope that the truth will finally come out so Natalie's parents can finally get some closure. And that, my friend, is the story of Natalie Holloway, a girl who went missing on a high school graduation trip. After almost two decades of searching, she still remains a mystery. There's numerous speculations on the internet, but the truth stays unknown. So who do you think did it? 
Was it Yoron, the Kobo brothers, or someone else? As always, I would like to know your opinion, so leave your comments down below. Thank you so much for watching this video, and if you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, subscribe, and remember, be safe, be vigilant, and take care.